The May 17, 2011 meeting of the Town of Cape Elizabeth Planning Board is called to order. The first item on our agenda is the minutes of our April 27th meeting. Anyone have any comments on the minutes? Nope. Motion? Eliza? Motion to approve the minutes. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? None. So that's five of us in favor, which is all of us tonight. The first substantive item on the agenda is Golden Ridge Subdivision Amendment. Golden Ridge LLC is requesting amendments to the previously approved Golden Ridge Subdivision to create another lot located at the end of Golden Ridge Lane in accordance with the subdivision amendment. And we will have a public hearing, but I'd first like to ask the applicant to make a presentation. Um, briefly describe the project, but mostly focus on what has changed since our last meeting. Thank you. And my name is John Mitchell, Mitchell Associates, and I represent uh, Golden Ridge Lane LLC. Uh, very briefly, the, the location uh, is off of Route 77. Uh, the site is outlined in red. Uh, it is approximately, the total acreage of the parcel consists of approximately 15 acres. Uh, it's in the RA zone, most of it's in the RA zone. There are portions that are RP1 and RP2. An aerial survey shows that uh, almost the entire parcel is wooded. Uh, this is Golden Ridge Lane that extends from Route 77 up to the existing Young residence. This is a copy of the 2003 subdivision plan that was approved uh, showing a three lot subdivision. Uh, this is Golden Ridge Lane. Uh, lot one is three acres. Lot two consists of two acres and lot three consists of 10, a little over 10 acres. And this is a copy of the uh, proposed amended subdivision plan showing the additional lot. So lot one and two remain as they were approved. Uh, the extension of Golden Ridge Lane occurs in this area right here. Lot 3 consists of a 1.87, uh, I believe, uh, 1.8 acre lot, minimum lot size. And lot 4 is a uh, 6 point, uh, I'm sorry, I can't, uh, yeah, 6.9 acre lot. Uh, so that's, that's briefly the, the proposal, um, the request that we're making uh, for an additional lot. Uh, I will review with the board at this point uh, the, the changes that have been made to the plan since the last, uh, pro since the last meeting um, and, and also uh, as of the site visit uh, uh, that you all attended. Uh, the first change, we added some additional notes to the plan to clarify uh, the, uh, the identification of the building envelope. And uh, one of the, the notes, uh, I'll just read, activities outside the building envelope restricted to the installation of driveways, utilities, and trails. So we, we were asked to put that note on the plan, and that's note number 14. Number two, uh, can I ask you a question on yes. that? Were you reading literally from the note? Because my note 14 here is, is phrased slightly differently from what you did. That's correct. And uh, Maureen asked us to revise that note to what I just Okay, so just we, it's what you're reading from is an updated version of what we have in front of us. Right. Thank and you. the revised plan um, has been changed to read the 
note that I just wrote. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, the second change, uh, upon further evaluation, uh, we decided to maintain the existing hammerhead uh, within the Golden Ridge Lane roadway. Um, the reason for this basically was, initially we, had, we were proposing to convey it to Steve and Leslie Young. Um, it was decided uh, because we needed a CMP easement uh, from the utility pole, we decided to, at least at this point, to keep the, uh, the old hammerhead within the Golden Ridge Lane uh, roadway. Under landscaping, uh, we have added three additional uh, Colorado blue spruce. I guess uh, you, you discussed this at the site visit with Betsy. And uh, those three have been added. Uh, it's, hard, it's hard to see, but we have added three additional uh, trees in this location here. Um, I did meet with Steve Young this afternoon. We discussed uh, the location of those trees. On your plans, it shows the additional trees placed in the middle um, of the remote extension. However, he he preferred to have the trees closer to uh, the opening to his driveway. So we have revised the plan um, to show those trees in that location. Um, as well as adding a note uh, under the plant list that indicates location of trees shall be coordinated with site conditions to provide maximum visual screening. And the intent is to, when we're ready to plant the trees, is to get together with Steve and Leslie, go out and to locate the trees to, in order to maximize uh, the, the optimum sc screening. Quick question. Weren't those trees originally going to be where the hammerhead is now, where you're preserving the hammerhead turnaround? Um, we had a cluster of trees here. Okay. A cluster of trees here. Yeah. On your plans, the trees were added. Okay. Betsy added them here based on your discussions on the site visit. Gotcha. But uh, Steve and Leslie would prefer to have the trees in this location. Right. But but the, but the turnaround is going to be there, right? So you probably can't plant them there. This turnaround? Yeah. Well, that will no longer be a turnaround. The turn, oh, the I said you're now preserving is, it. Is at the end. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I thought you were preserving the lower. Turn. No, we're just we're just uh, incorporating that land area within the the road right, right of way. Thank you. So you're going to plant the trees in the right of way. Yes. Great. In this case, they will be in the right of way. Okay. All right. Thanks. And the intent is to to fill in this area where the driveway is. Okay. Yep. Thank you. So you're proposing to take that hammerhead, I, I didn't hear you properly, you're proposing to take the first hammerhead out and only have one at the end? Yes, there, it, there won't be a need for this hammerhead here to, to maneuver vehicles in, because that hammerhead will be located at the end of the drive. But then I noticed that the, the end of the hammer is quite small by comparison to what it was on the original drawing. Well, the original the, drawing, I think you, uh, you uh, 82 feet, I think you added, or something like that. On this one here, you've got 40 feet. So yeah. you halved it in the hammerhead uh, halved. We, we didn't do the original design for the, the hammerhead, but this hammerhead meets the town specs. Which it meets the town specs, then it meets the town specs. Yeah. And that the... Uh, um, the, the fire brigade and the fire tender can turn around in that hammerhead. The fire chief has reviewed the plans. Uh, number four under pedestrian easements. If you remember, we originally had a, a 15 foot wide pedestrian easement along the, uh, the northerly side of lot three. We have removed that pedestrian easement and we have added, uh, basically we removed it 
to improve the privacy of the residents of Lot 3. Um, the following bullet has to do with additional easements. And um, the way it's worded in our letter, uh, I think Betsy's understanding, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't here, but Betsy's understanding was that um, a pedestrian easement in this area would have impacted the wetlands. So um, she made the decision not to propose an easement. Um, since then, I've had further discussions with Marine as well as the applicant, Sheldon. And Sheldon is receptive to placing a 15-foot wide pedestrian trail easement in this location here, keeping it out of the wetlands. Um, however, he, uh, he's out of the country as well, and uh, he would like the opportunity to visit the site and review the location of the easement uh, to make sure that there is not an impact to this property, as well as to review the markability of having an easement here. Um, so he has asked me to ask you if he could have the option of either putting this pedestrian easement in this location or paying the impact fee. Uh, he would like to reserve the right to decide after he visits the, the property. So I did place the, the location of the easement here just to illustrate um, Again, it's, it's difficult to see, but it's... Can you zoom in, John? Excuse me? Can you zoom in? Can I zoom in? I don't know. Can we? Yeah, you see at the top near the right that says zoom, 88%? Right at the top there? Uh, let's see. Let's see. Yep. Can you change that 88 to something bigger? Just scroll down a little. Oops. But he's talking about pedestrian. When you say pedestrian, would that be limited to pedestrian? Yes. And not snowmobiles? Correct. Yeah, no My understanding from the sidewalk is that the current use now is primarily snowmobiles. Yeah, there wouldn't be snowmobiles allowed. Um, and then, oh, I'm sorry, that's a, that's a different plan here. Okay, there it is. So there's the location of the proposed 15-foot wide pedestrian trail easement. Um, so given that the um, pedestrian easement begins on the private road, does that mean that the only people who could access no. that pedestrian e um, easement are the people who own land? No, if, if this were to occur, we would, we would uh, provide a public easement down the roadway. Oh, you would? Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Because already there is a, there's, as you know, there's a trail that goes down, you know, the existing yep. and terminates here. We would extend that to this point. Okay, great. How would you get to that, uh, to this, what do you call it, a pedestrian access easement on the top left-hand side of the, it sort of ends in the RA zone at the bottom and ends at the top of lot three. How do you get there? I mean, it, it sort of seems cut off to me. I'm not sure I understand you. There's a, there's a 15 foot wide pedestrian access easement at the top left-hand side of the plan. Right here. Right How do you there. get on to it? Oh, um, you access that, from? that is accessed, I believe, right here from Correct Marine. Right, right. Okay, and you can go and up through there? Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm, but I was wondering how you got to this one. I, I see it now. Okay. And so, 
you know, right now there, there, is no, there is no connection from this point out to the adjacent street. Um, so this, if this were to occur, it would only occur once that connection, once that future connection is made. Because there'd be no sense for the public to circulate to the boundary line here. So the, I guess the question that we're asking the board at this point is, uh, can the applicant have the option of either doing, either providing the easement or the fee? I think we can get into that discussion after we okay. have our public hearing. Okay. Thank you. And then the final, uh, the final change has been the road maintenance agreement. And uh, uh, we are, our goal is to have one road maintenance agreement that uh, everybody, that all lots can sign on to, having a, a single road maintenance agreement. Um, what we have submitted to you in our packet are two road maintenance agreements. The first document would be uh, road maintenance responsibilities for the front portion of the road that would include all of the lot owners. And the second road maintenance agreement is for only the last two lots, which would include this section of the roadway, the extension of the Golden Ridge Lane. What, what's, what's keeping, what's stopping well, there from being one? It's, um, you know, it's, it's just, uh, we, we need to get everybody on board. Uh, there's, no, there's no one stopping it at this point. It's just, a, it, it's very time consuming. It will take some time to uh, sort out all of the issues and making sure that what we come up with is equitable for, for everyone. So that's, Lee Lowry is working on this, the attorney. Madam Chairman? Yes. They ask, if you were to grant an easement, for access to the to the suggested public way that runs off the private road. How does that affect it? Does that affect the uh, maintenance agreement? Does that have any effect on that, or if we were to provide a uh, a pedestrian easement, mm -hmm. would that have any effect on the road maintenance agreement? I don't think so. I mean, th this this has a pedestrian way that exists today, a mm -hmm. pedestrian trail. It would be similar to that. Okay. Okay. That's it. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else on the planning board have a question that we need to ask before we do the public hearing? All right, I'll now open the floor to a public hearing. If anyone would like to speak, please come up to the podium and give us your name and address. Anyone here who'd like to speak? Hi there, Steve Young, 8 Golden Ridge Lane. Yeah, I'd just like to clarify what John was saying about the pedestrian easement it is not part of the existing Gold Ridge Lane. It runs beside it. And I don't know, Maureen probably answered the question better, but I don't think they put Greenbelt trails on private roads. They're usually in the green. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for you. <coughs> so how, how do you feel about the value of that pedestrian easement? I mean, given that you live there, do you feel like there's value in having connectivity, possibly, to the east? I think, you know, like I spoke to Maureen before, people are using it now to walk and stuff, but, mm -hmm. you know, I think you'd have to connect it somehow to the trail. You know what I mean? 
connected to the trail that runs on the other side of your house. Yeah, either bring the easement down over the property some more. Or, uh, yeah, I don't think you want people coming out into the roadway to, to access the trail. Coming out onto 77? No, the private road. Oh, oh okay. You don't? No. Okay. So you would want to see the easement running next to the road, outside of the right of way? I would think so, yeah. But they do use it now, and I am not opposed to a PMN. Yeah. And so people walk yeah. across the property? Because okay. we were under the impression after the site walk that it was mostly snowmobilers. That's why the trail is, exists, is because of snowmobilers. So the snowmobilers cut it, but then pedestrians use it? Uh, later, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? Anyone else want to address the proposed amendment to the Golden Ridge subdivision? All right, then the public hearing is now closed. Planning board members, questions? Anyone? Liza? <laughs> yeah. Okay. It may not be part of this. If I was living on, somebody living on this road, the beginning of the road is going to get a lot of traffic. People at the end are going to get very little traffic. The house at the end will have one car using it or two. And it will progressively get more wear all the way down. So is it proportional, proportional repair or maintenance, or is it just standard? You all pay the same amount when it's needed. I mean, it's just a question. John, you want to answer that? Yeah. And, and that's. That's the reason why we have two agreements, is that the, you're right, the front portion will, will get more vehicles, more wear, and everybody is, will share in that responsibility. Including the, the, new, the new extension? Yes. Yeah, because they'll use it also. And then, and then the second document, as I said, will only pertain to the, the rear two. The, the, the amount of involvement is proportional to where you live. Yes. Anybody else? Liza? You have a well, question? I mean, just as a point of discussion, I feel like the, the real interesting issue here is can we give the applicant the option to have the easement or pay the open space impact fee? And uh, I don't have a lot of experience with pedestrian easements, so. I guess I'm curious uh, to know more about Mr. Young's comment about would we put it on the right of way or next to the right of way and which would make the most sense. Um, it's either on the applicant's lot or on the Young's lot if it's not on the right of way, it seems, that easement extension to connect with the green belt. I see. Okay. And, yeah. and, um, but how important is it that it's so you're, outside of the right of way. You're referring to this section yeah, right in here. Right, yeah. That segment. Um, so maybe some guidance from Maureen on that, or yeah, what are your insights? I don't know why we couldn't extend that easement. I mean, this is unusable land. It's. Um, I don't see why we couldn't extend it down along the edge of the right of way, the outside edge of the right of way, but uh, Maureen. Sure. A um, couple of questions. The first one is providing the applicant with an option. Just so the board is aware, I'm not saying you can't do that, but under um, subdivision ordinance standard Q where the open space impact fee resides, it says that um, in order to accommodate the expected needs of the subdivision for open space and recreational areas without diminishing the community standard of public open space, the applicant shall be required to donate land or cash contribution in lieu of actual land dedication or combination of both at the option of the board. So you would be delegating your authority to the applicant if you left the option with them. Um, the second question is whether um, it would be preferable to have the pedestrian connection on the new section of Golden Ridge Lane or on the adjacent section, a, a land adjacent to the new section of Golden Ridge Lane. Um, the current trail um, is immediately adjacent to Golden Ridge Lane. Um, and that is a section that is relatively well used because it's a main access point to Great Pond. Uh, I do staff the Conservation Commission. 
and one of their challenges is maintenance of existing trails. And I would, uh, I can't speak for them because I have not looked at this, but it seems that it would probably be more practical to put this other section on the new portion of Golden Ridge Lane because there's only two houses there. There's not going to be a lot of cars. And the odds of maintaining a path immediately adjacent with this level of traffic, I think is going to be pretty difficult for that that commission to do, even with the additional help they're now getting for maintenance. So, but I can't give you an answer, you know, exactly what they would want to do uh, without going to the commission and presenting that to them. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and then, so that brings another question to mind. So, do we have the resources to maintain a pedestrian easement and clear, clear the way where that proposed one is on the plan? Again, the, the town of Cape Elizabeth has a Greenbelt plan that's been adopted by the town council. The Conservation Commission is the steward of the Greenbelt system, and they have never let the burden of maintenance uh, dissuade them from accepting pedestrian easements where they make sense. In addition, um, the council has just approved a part-time, it's a seasonal position, that will be assisting the Conservation Commission with trail maintenance. So uh, it would be, I think it would be unfortunate if maintenance were, or were, were to be used as a reason one way or the other to determine whether or not this is a, an appropriate uh, option for the town. Um, we're, we're handling the maintenance issues. Okay. And then, oh, sorry. lastly, just a related question. How, how could we get the Conservation Commission to look at this and weigh in on the issue? That is currently yes, that the town's was option. My question whether this, from the Conservation Commission's point of view, it might not make more sense to have the money as opposed to this particular small piece of connection. Certainly, we, we can ask the Conservation Commission to look at this. Um, they meet the second Tuesday of the month, so they met last Tuesday. They won't, um, they won't officially meet again until the second Tuesday in June. They did not look at this plan that was before the planning board because it didn't include resource protection permit, which is what they look at, and they weren't aware that there was this pedestrian easement issue at their last meeting. So that's why you didn't hear from them. I'm sure they'd be happy to provide you with comments. Um, the question is whether the applicant is hoping to get a, a resolution tonight on this application or whether they're willing to wait another month. No, we're hoping to get a resolution. Anybody else have other questions or other thoughts on this particular issue? Carol? Yes, this particular issue. Okay, move on then. I want to understand the rebuilding of the current section of uh, Golden Ridge Lane. Talks about in the, in the note that we have with the notes from Steve Harding uh, about the box cut and te test permits to determine whether the gra existing dra ga gravel and uh, quality of gravel is, is adequate. And then we have a note that we received tonight from the Public Works Director, who seems inclined to think that, if I'm in reading it correctly, that it should be rebuilt and test permits, test pits are, are not yeah, going to do the job. And, and I'm going to let the applicant chime in. This is, this is uh, a disagreement between the town staff and the applicant. Um, when Golden Ridge, Golden, let me put it this way, just because Golden Ridge Lane is called a lane doesn't mean it was ever built as a road. It, it was originally built as a private driveway. There was no inspection by the town, there was no review of it by the town because people can build private driveways without any kind of town review. Um, in 2003, we now had three houses with access off of Golden Ridge Lane and a proposal to add two more lots with access off of Golden Ridge Lane, and at that time, uh, it was approved as a private road with the condition that it be built to town private road standards. And that has never happened. So the current applicant is before you to add another lot and is requesting that the, its approach to rebuilding the road be to basically dig test pits in certain locations to try to confirm what's actually under there. Uh, the code, excuse me, the public works director and the town engineer are saying that no matter how you set up a test pit pattern, in the end you're guessing. And they're recommending that you in fact 
dig up what's there um, and make sure you're putting in the 18 inches of gravel where it ought to be. Um, they are saying that if the applicant can find records that show what was actually built originally, they'd be willing to look at that as an alternative. They're also saying that if they pull out the gravel and it meets standards, they could put the same gravel back. That would be a field yield decision, not something that has to be dealt with by the planning board. But I think that kind of gives you your two options. And the applicant still wants to do the test pit method? Or has there been discussion? Yeah. Further discussion? There, there has been discussion. I, I've talked to Bob Malley about it, and it's just, uh, you know, we disagree, basically. It's just, you know, this, what he is asking for is for us to go in and completely reconstruct the existing um, Golden Ridge Lane portion, uh, which is an extremely costly endeavor. Um, our approach, as Maureen said, is to go in and dig a series of test pits to demonstrate that we got the proper depth and the proper material. Um, and it seems like, I mean, if, if, if we find that we don't have either one of those, then we'll, we'll do what Bob is asking. But we just think that to go in and just completely box cut the road, remove all the gravel, and then replace it um, without allowing us the opportunity to first go in and check it is uh, a very costly. I think economics should play a role in this, and uh, so we disagree with that. Uh, the other thing I just want to say is that Marine is right that, that there was a condition of the 2003 approval of the subdivision plan um, that the road had to be brought up to town road standards. However, it didn't mention anything about requiring to go in and box cut. So I guess that's, that's where we uh, disagree. costly. Madam Jim? Yes. What's the time frame it's going to take you to do that? To do your... To reconstruct the roadway? No, to determine if you were to do your testing as you wished proposed to do. How long will it take you to determine the result? Oh, it wouldn't take long at all. It would take, you know, it would take a day to go in and dig a series of test pits. And I mean, you know, we're talking about maybe, you know, test pit every, every 50 feet. Um, and then send the material to SW Cole, geotechnical engineers, to the lab, have it analyzed. And I don't know, that, I think that takes a couple weeks to get the results back. And also with regard to the applicant's preference, do I understand correctly tonight? Clarify for me, if you would, please. Uh, are they prepared, or is the preference tonight to pay the fee? Is that the preference? To, I'm sorry. To pay the open space fee. Is that the preference? No, the pref I guess uh, uh, Sheldon's preference is to have this pedestrian trail easement in lieu of the fee. sort of seems to me like there's some, there's some significant issues on which I'm not comfortable that we have substantial information. If there is a proposal for a pedestrian trail to be accepted in lieu of the fee, I don't feel comfortable deciding that without input from the Conservation Commission. And if we have a technical dis dispute between the town engineer and the applicant on what is an adequate way to determine whether this road is or isn't constructed in accordance with I think standards. I'm, I, I think Henry has a good idea, but I'm not an engineer. And I just from the site going out there and looking, it's quite clear that this project was not developed in a conventional way. And so I'm leery that this road is going to meet 
the standards. So for us to say one kind of pit over another kind of pit is going to get us there, well, I'm not comfortable making that the, call. With regard to the road, that has been resolved. I mean, Bob Malley is not going to change his mind. I tried to change his mind. He's not going to change his mind. So as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's a done deal. In other words, the applicant's willing to go with what he's asking for. Unless the board feels differently. It, but it's not going to be up to Bob Malley. I mean, Bob Malley's not going to change his mind. But the board members may feel differently. Yeah. I, I was ready to put, include in a motion that the road should be done according to the town engineers and Bob Malley's recommendation. <laughs> I feel that comfortable with that. Motion, but I have, I have concerns about the pedestrian easement and the... The applicant who, at, right, and I, if I were him, I would want to do this as well, go out and actually determine, am I making a good call by doing this? And so he can be on site. Unfortunately, he's not available to do that right, right now. And how do, we, how do we say, yes, we'll take an easement, or yes, we'll take the fee, unless we know he really is 100% behind the easement? Yeah. which he won't know until he does his own site walk. And, and if, the board if the board doesn't want to allow that option, provide that option to the applicant, then I would say Sheldon probably would want the board to vote on this application and he would pay the fee instead of the easement. Is there a way that we can delegate the issue of the easement to the Conservation Commission and Sheldon? Yeah, it's only Sheldon's option if the Conservation Commission deems it favorable? I don't Is that want too to delegate it. I don't want to get, delegate my vote on that no. to the Conservation you Commission. Don't. No, okay, not I without don't. hearing their I don't feel comfortable analysis. With that. It's, it's really their advisory to the Planning Board. Gotcha. Okay. One other question, something that came up on our site walk and I haven't seen here, is there are a lot of down trees and construction debris left from earlier construction efforts. And if I understood the site layout correctly, some of it is on the applicant's land, some of it is on the neighbor's land. And one of the representations that was made is that at the time that this road is constructed, all of that debris, down trees and other things, would be removed from the property, and I don't see any of that here. Um, yeah, there, there is no note to that effect. And I think, uh, uh, to me, one of the opportunities presented here is to clean up a development that was left in a very poor condition, and although the current owner wasn't the cause of it, the current owner inherits the land with all of its problems, and this is one of them, as is the road, and, and I would want to see that here, too, because the site was left in a condition that I think needs to be cleaned up. Okay. That can be the condition. I understood that that had been agreed to, so I would just want to see that. Right. John, I'm confused. Did, I thought I, maybe I misunderstood my question. I, I thought I had asked the question, did I not, what the applicant preferred, and you said the pedestrian easement, and then you just said you preferred the pedestrian. Well, if the, board, if the board is going to table this for another month, I'm fairly certain that the applicant would, would just go ahead and pay the fee. Oh, I see. And because he does want to, he does want to move forward with um, the infrastructure, the, the roadway, and, and uh, the sale of lots. And, 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 and Emphatically, there's no reservation about the decision of the public works director regarding to the road. It's going to be done up to those standards. Unless the board feels differently. Right. Yeah. Maureen, I have a couple questions on our proposed motion here and the findings of fact. The findings of fact are muddled. Okay. To start with. So if we're going to do findings of fact, I guess we need a little guidance. Yeah, and I apologize for that. I think there was a little too much cutting and pasting going on. Number four uh, doesn't seem quite current, nor does number five. Yes, those are the ones you want to take out. So those can just be deleted? Just delete them. Okay. 
and we would want to add some kind of a note on the cleaning up of the trees and the debris. So that would just be a number seven, not in the findings, but in the conditions. There'd be a number seven that the applicant would remove down trees and other construction debris. Now, some of that is not on the applicant's property. Do we have, would we need some kind of a agreement? The, probably the easiest way to structure the, um, the condition, which you would want to make number six and make number six, number seven. Um, you want number seven, number six oh, to yeah. be last. Okay, right. Um, probably the easiest way to do that would be to require the applicant to clean up all the debris on his own property and on the neighbor's property if a written consent can be obtained from the neighbor. Okay. My neighbor, is there a lot number for the youngs? I don't see it here. There was one time, but probably at this point in the world. Lot number two. 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 Eight Golden Ridge Lane? Yes. So condition one is correct because Bob Malley is just agreeing with the town engineer on the proposed road. Well, I believe it's, I think it's paragraph five of the engineer's letter that no, mentions the same issue that the public works director. I, I, think, it's felt, not, I think it's paragraph two. Yeah, he felt, he felt strongly and I encouraged him if you feel strongly you should let the board know how strongly you feel. So it was a memo written in support of the town engineer's letter. Okay. So, but, but for these purposes, if we just reference the town engineer's letter, we're fine. You are. Anybody else have any questions about a possible motion? Liza? Yeah, I do. I just feel like this is a great opportunity to have, to increase the pedestrian access in town and preserve a, a walkway that's currently used. And I'm just wondering if there's a creative way that we can, um, that we can get this this subdivision amendment going and preserve the option to have that easement. Well, we and could I grant this and the applicant giving the applicant the option. The applicant if, could apply for an amendment and we could then consider the amendment. In the meantime, the applicant could go ahead with the creating of the lot. And if the applicant wa wants to have the authority necessary to convey lots, if we approve it tonight with the payment, the money payment, the applicant's always free to come in and request an amendment, and at that point, that would be the only issue that would go to the Conservation Commission, and that would give us the time to do that. Right. At what cost to the applicant? I'm just afraid maybe it won't be worth the applicant's time and money to amend the subdivision. I would even be willing to allow the applicant to request a reconsideration of a prior vote, which does not have an application fee. Does that affect the authority to convey this, the new subdivision lot if they're asking for it to be reconsidered? No, because they really cannot convey the lot until the planning board signs the plat and records it. Mm -hmm. And I really doubt that, any of, that all of these conditions will be met and uh, the applicant will be ready to collect signatures prior to 30 days from tonight. So the reconsideration can only happen at the, at the very next meeting. Okay. So that would give the applicant time. So what would the well, process, process be for an letter. letter? Letter. But also a we'll plan be showing be the back in the country in oh, yeah. a month. Well, yeah. well if, if the board were to uh, require the pedestrian easement tonight, and then the applicant really just wanted to pay the fee, we wouldn't need a revision to the plan. Oh. Uh, so you wouldn't even need a plan. Hold on to the plans you have tonight. But I guess I'm inclined to go with the money and not to go with That's the fine. easement. As but a final matter, or? It, no, but then uh, to it. say that the default is to, for us to accept the money, and if the applicant wants to come back with an actual plan for an easement that then goes to the Conservation Commission, 
and the commission determines that it's more in the town's interest to get this particular path, then that could come back to us with the Conservation Commission's recommendation. I am too, and it's cleaner because we don't then have to add the condition of creating an easement down that segment of the private road. Right. Yeah. All right, so. Somebody want to make a motion? Let's <laughs> go for it. All right, here we go. Before you do that, what's the motion to the drive over the drive, the road? I don't think. It's, it's in, it, as in the, the draft motion we have here, it's to incorporate the town engineer's letter, and the town engineer's letter is consistent with redoing the road. Yeah. All right. So I've got a motion for the board to consider findings of fact. Golden Ridge LLC is requesting an amendment to the previously approved Golden Ridge subdivision to add another lot at the end of Golden Ridge Lane, which requires review under Section 1625 amendments to previously approved subdivisions. Number two, the town engineer is recommending revisions to the plans to bring the subdivision design into compliance with town standards. Number three, preservation of landscaping should be incorporated into the development of the lots. Number four, the planning board by this vote grants waivers to road design standards to permit the construction of the subdivision road as depicted on the plans. And number five, the applicant has substantially addressed the standards of the subdivision ordinance, section 1631. Therefore, be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Golden Ridge LLC for an amendment to the previously approved Golden Ridge subdivision to add another lot at the end of Golden Ridge Lane be approved, subject to the following conditions. Number one, that the engineer's plans be revised to address the recommendations in the town's engineer's letter, dated May 11, 2011. Number two, that a note be added to the plans indicating that downed trees and other debris near lot number two, 8 Golden Ridge Lane, um, be cleaned up. Number three, the, that written confirmation be provided from the Youngs that they grant permission for the proposed planting and the debris cleanup, um, or the plan will be revised to eliminate the plantings and cleanup. Number four, that a note be added to the plans restricting activities outside the building envelope to the installation of driveways and utilities. Number five, that road maintenance agreements be submitted in a form acceptable to the town attorney, signed by the applicant and any other parties or recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds. Number six, that the applicant pay a fee of $4,455. Um, as an open space impact fee. And number seven, that the plans be revised for the above conditions and submitted to the town planner for review and approval, and that there be no recording of the plat until the above conditions have been satisfied. Second. Did you say in there, because if so, I missed it, that the applicant, that a note be added that required the applicant to move the remove the debris? Let's see, I did, I think I did, that a note be added to the plans indicating that down trees and other debris near lot number two be cleaned up. I guess I didn't say that the applicant would be cleaning them up. But is, is that a given? If it's no, that's plan? fine. Okay. okay. Do we want to add, Maureen made a suggestion that uh, permission to, to um, from the Youngs to uh, I, I added that into the, um, very to the, oh, you cleverly did. Yeah. Okay. So yep. cleverly I missed it. Okay. <laughs> Any further discussion? Hiromi, did you get all of that? No, I'll have to get it up to the Oh, all right. So we ready to vote? All right. All in favor? It's five of us in favor. None opposed. Motion carries. Great, thank you. Uh, Carol. I'll be curious to know what the applicant decides about the easement. Thank you.
The next item on the agenda, Rosewood Subdivision Amendment. Joe Frustacci is requesting amendments to the previously approved Rosewood Subdivision to create another lot at the end of Rosewood Drive in accordance with Section 1625 Subdivision Amendment, and we will have a public hearing after the applicant makes his presentation. Madam Chair, I'll be right with you, if you don't mind, a little technical uh, issue here. And I'm there. If you don't mind, we will... Uh, and okay. Better? Thank you. This is the comedy section of the evening here. I'm paying him by the hour. That's why we have to go ahead. Let's try that. If you need more push pins, there in the podium. Wait, did you hear that? I'm sorry. Oh, there you go. Good job. We got push pins behind us. Here we go. Bear with us. We, I promise we'll be right with you. This is for your viewing pleasure. There we go. Thank you for your patience. No problem. These things happen. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. Rick Light, uh, Light Environmental Design, and the applicant, Joseph Fustaccio. Um, since our site walk, I'll take a minute, if you'd like, and go through the plan changes since the last meeting in the site walk. Please do. Uh, first of all, and I'm looking for a pointer. Is there a pointer here, Maureen? What's that? The point, do we have a pointer here? That's that's okay, but we could just just uh, I can just use the cue on here, and uh, that that'll work fine, Marie. Okay. Anyway, okay, we'll get going here. I promise. Okay. The the changes since the last meeting. There were several comments from the town engineer, also from the planning board, and I'll walk you through the the, the substantive changes to the plan. 
Uh, number one is that there was the issue that you remember from the site walk of the drainage easements, which uh, was requested that again, the drainage runs across the back of, of lot 4B, and it was requested that we had a 15-foot drainage easement on the back of lot 4B and a 15-foot drainage easement on the back of 4A, and those are on the plans now to encompass the drainage swale, which again picks up the runoff, as you remember, from the site walk and runs uh, to the back of 4B and enters into the town property and further down to Mitchell, to Mitchell Road. So those have been added to the plan and draft uh, deed, uh, easement deeds have been included in your May 4th packet for those lots, uh, draft language. The second item of substance uh, based on comments from the town engineer is we slightly revised the T turnaround geometry in two different ways. Uh, one is we, we uh, changed the radius. We, we have a power pole, if you recall from the site walk, it's about seven feet from the property pin right here where the arrow is. And the town requirement was for a 20 foot radius. So we we're not, not able to achieve the 20 foot radius because of the power pole. We did center the, the T and, and, and the orientation to the pavement was off by a couple degrees from 90. So we adjusted that, and we did put a 20-foot easement on this corner here. But also, we, we took, uh, based on comments for the town's emergency vehicle, we took a, 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 a B40, uh, which is a, sort of a bus design, a 40-foot vehicle, 32-foot wheelbase design, and used a template and found for a vehicle to come in, for instance, and make a backing movement and pull out, uh, because the existing rose would drive is 18 feet, the vehicle would need more, it comes into the geometry, would need more room in the width department. So we actually have proposed additional gravel in here to widen the end of the roadway such that a vehicle could actually pull in, make an appropriate backing movement, and pull out again. And so that's been added. It's within the right of way, and it's been added to the, to the plan. The third thing is that we had add uh, the town engineer had asked as a minor comment that the silt fence be shown graphically, which was shown at the edge of the property line. We've added that, put, made sure that the silt fence along the edge of the swale would be on the property line, and added a note to add silt fence at the base of the wall down here as needed during construction. And the other item that was addressed was, and we talked about the site walk. The original plan had, the plan proposes uh, additional infill buffering. The applicant wasn't, had, as we talked about the site walk, had suggested that on his own cognizance that he add some white pines to the lot as infill. We looked at that, that buffer uh, with lot three in the site walk. And on the original plan, we had actually shown some of the trees here in the right of way. We have taken those trees graphically and suggested that they be on the lot. And we've suggested this conceptually with a note saying final location of trees to be placed by the applicant as infill. But we've taken those trees out of the town's right of way or the the private right away so they don't have to be in responsibility of the road maintenance agreement. Those are essentially the plan changes that we have made uh, also in your application. I think you'll find that we did receive our letter and provided the letter uh, from, the, from the Portland Water District and there's additional information uh, regarding the financial capacity of the applicant and technical capacity. So I think all that information is in there. Thank you. Okay, any questions from members of the planning board before we open the public hearing? Okay, the public hearing is... Ne oh, go ahead, Liza. Um, the, um, the town engineer had said something about a, a, a clay barrier. I, I can't find it. It's not at my fingertips right now. Yes. Adding like a clay wall to you know, not let water through. And I'm wondering if you made any changes based on that recommendation. No, I was going to go through those comments after that, but I'll, I'll jump to that now. The, the town engineers, but no, it's perfectly applicable. In the May 11th town engineers response letter, uh, they agreed that we've addressed all items. The one item that's outstanding that uh, Boreen, should the board go to a findings of fact tonight, uh, would be as a condition of approval, is that we take the boulder retaining wall, and I'll show that right here, and there's a detail on the second sheet, and add a clay liner behind it, and just add some additional detailing to that wall. Uh, we haven't had an opportunity to do that since the letter came out last week, but we're in agreement of doing that, and we agreed on the site walk. We talked about that. So if that could be made a conditional approval, we're certainly in agreement of doing that. Yes. Great. Thank you. So now we will open the public hearing. If there's any member of the public who 
wishes to speak on this proposed amendment to the Rosewood subdivision, please come forward and give us your name and address. Anyone here who wishes to speak on this item? No one. All right. In that case, the public hearing is closed. So we can now proceed with any questions that any member of the board might have on the application. Who wants to start? Liza? Well, I guess just to follow up on that question. So that, um, that's a great side view of Thank the retaining you. wall, the silt, silt fence, or the, sorry, the clay mm -hmm. liner. Mm -hmm. How can we be sure the water's not going to go below that liner and the rocks and then work its way? to the adjacent house. Fair, fair question. Maybe I can explain. I thought based on our site walk and based on the discussions about the wall, when we're looking at plan views such as this, I know it's hard for people to understand. I, I thought for the public hearing and for the presentation, it would make a lot of sense to do a cross section as we discussed because it's easier to talk about the issues and what it would look like. So let me, if, you, if I can uh, just show you what this represents. Uh, this plan is an exaggerated scale, of, uh, so it's not one to one, but some, you know, to give a graphic representation. This is, for instance, looking south at, at, the, at the lot, in other words, facing on the plan, facing uh, towards the right this way, right in the middle of the lot where the septic system is. And this is the property line here, and the existing grade is something like this. And for a sense of scale, this is about elevation 90, um, and this is that high spot in the middle of the lot, you remember about elevation 96, 97, somewhere in there uh, at, at the high spot. And the proposal on the plan, if you recall, we're going to fill the, the front part of the lot to the road a little bit. This represents a, a, a typical house with the first floor elevation at 101 and a half approximately. Uh, and, and then the lawn behind the house at a gradual slope so it can be a usable lawn. And you can see the amount of several feet of fill over the, the course of the back of the property. And this is that swale that we've talked so much about on top of the wall, was an interceptor swale. This is the swale that would collect the water, pick it up, and discharge it. And, and at this point, the project, I took the point where the wall is at the highest, which is right in the middle of the lot. And this is about four and a half feet uh, overall wall height, somewhere in that range. And what we're talking about is a boulder wall. And then the way the drainage works, the answer to the question is, the lawn and the swale would, of course, be uh, made of, of loam, so, and loam is, is partially impervious. And then below that, what we're suggesting is behind the wall, we typically put a, a gravel fill, a free draining material, and then, and also as a base for the wall, as a standard detail for wall construction. And then we would put a clay barrier behind that as well. So if there's water intercepting a swale and it gets into the wa water, that water doesn't go further uh, behind the wall. And then the, the second thing that we wanted, there was questions about, and I thought I would do this graphically so it, it helps to address questions before they come up. This is the septic system, which would be a three-chambered, the plastic-chambered system. And what it suggests, and, and what this shows, there was a question about, uh, I think one of the abutters about, does the septic system effluent have a chance of going through the wall? Does it meet code? First question is, no, it does not have a chance of going through the wall. This envelope would be what was required, what would be required under the plumbing code if you just filled the septic system but didn't have any grading going on. And you can see the wall is pulling out the, the, the fill slope, which is a four to one fill slope beyond the septic system with a three foot extension. If this were just raw land, then everything we're doing is above that slope but doesn't have any impact on the septic system. Uh, and, and the septic system meets code. So that you don't have the situation of effluent you know, coming out of the wall, and it's just not going to happen because we're above that elevation. So between the, the clay liner and having uh, the, the barrier behind the, the, the wall and having the, the, the loam in place as well, there'd be very little groundwater, surface water, excuse me, that you expect it to infiltrate. Now what happens with groundwater? Groundwater is always going to seek its own anyway, and so this won't affect the groundwater per se, other than the fact that water that might have otherwise you know, gone one direction is going in a different. But if there's any groundwater you know, below grade down here, this won't really have any effect on groundwater per se, I wouldn't expect. Does that answer your question? And so will that so will that gravel fill retain the water between the clay liner and the wall? The, the gravel fill is actually intended to allow water to weep. And the reason is you don't want to have a wall that has pressure behind it. And, and these walls, the intent here is to build these as dry rock, very, you know, very aesthetic, you know, dry rock walls. These aren't mortared walls where you're building a pressure. So 
water, the town engineers asked that we put a, a, a footing drain in, and number one, and two, what water naturally does is it naturally just weeps between the rocks anyway, and this acts as an envelope around, around that with a barrier behind it. So any water that does get in behind it would weep, would weep out and not build up as, as pressure. But typically with these kinds of walls, that's not an issue as if you have a concrete wall, which is totally impervious, and if you get pressure behind it, you typically see those little relief pipes coming out because that allows water in the in the granular envelope to to weep out. So, I think this would be the time when Mr. Fustachi would like me to circulate his pictures. There's two sets, mm -hmm. same picture, same picture on that one. You want to tell them this is a similar wall? Yeah. And this is picture of a similar wall somewhere else. Similar wall in town, and it's it's a shorter wall. I think that's a couple of feet. So imagine like two, two rocks high, but that, that's sort of the, the type of wall, very, like a landscape wall, very nice and aesthetic. Uh, not a, uh, again, a mortared, uh, mortared or concrete type of wall. It, um, just a quick question. Sure. In the winter when it, uh, water freezes and expands, mm -hmm. so it's going to get in between that and move the wall slightly. How many years, theoretically, would that wall last before it starts to break down? Uh, I movement would, through the ice and melting and ice. I can't tell you how long, but I, I, the, the, the philosophy here is, is that the fact that the walls are movable. These are not jointed rocks, number one. They're very heavy rocks. They typically don't, don't move. If they do, that's a good thing because it, it, they'll move with the earth a, a, an inch or a fraction of an inch. And the idea that water is behind it with the granular material, any water would weep out. We're going to be putting a drain in there. It would weep out between the yeah, rocks. You'd have... Uh, I mean, the frost line is six foot or something, so mm -hmm. it's going to, going to, water's going to be in there and it's going to freeze and expand, and it will move the walls slightly. The, not, you wouldn't expect it to move those, those types of walls, it'd be imperceptible. You know, the wall acts, the wall gives and takes, these walls do, with Mother Nature in a very imperceptible way to take the stress off when you have pressure behind it. But again, typically the wall, the water doesn't build up behind it because it, it weeps out, even in a frozen condition, any water would weep out between the joints and through an underdrain system. Um, so I, I wouldn't expect that to be a big issue. And as opposed to a, a concrete wall, where then I think the situation would be different. Where you, I mean, I went on the sidewalk, yeah. and I believe from what I looked at, yeah. the situation yeah. would be better after that wall yeah. was built than before. Okay. But I just wondered how long you could expect the wall to last. I would expect it to last a very 30, long 40, time. 100 years? I couldn't tell you, but I think it would be a very long time very long time yet. And, and, and point well taken that you know, any wall, any structure, may, time to time may need maintenance, chinking and that sort of thing, and that's just stand, I mean, with anything that you build, but uh, these are pretty low maintenance walls. Right. The clay actually yep. goes some way to stop the yep. it through the... Yep. And does the easement agreement clearly state that the owner of Lot 4A is responsible for that maintenance from time to I time? I believe it does. Uh, the, I'd have to I think it's reciprocal between the lots. Uh, yeah, this is kind of like a domino effect. Um, the easement was given to... Let's see, where are we? 4B gave an easement to 4A. 4A gave an easement to Lot 3 and the Giovanni's on the back property. Mm -hmm. And then it, it also gives them the opportunity to uh, if the owners of the downstream properties do not maintain it, then they have the option to come in and maintain the, uh, the drainage swale. So we feel as though everybody's been protected. But the way the agreements are set up, the primary responsibility for that is on the owner of Lot 4A? It's the pri primary responsibility is the owner of the lot to which the water is draining. So this. 4B four, four is responsible for the drainage easement here on their property. 4A would be responsible for the drainage easement in the back of their, their property. Okay. And if it's not working properly, then the owner of Mitchell Road can come in and talk with them and, and correct it if the owner of uh, Lot 4A does not correct it. And Lot 3 has that, also, that similar option. If I recall from the site walk, some of the water drains from Lot 3 to the lot immediately behind Lot 4A, which I think is the Germani's lot. That's correct. And then to Lot 4A. 
Is that right? Uh, no, I think once it gets on the Jumani's property, it, it goes um, down to the uh, sergeant's property. And that was his original concern. And we're giving them the option to drain the water onto Lot 4A uh, in a manner he sees fit. Uh, he also indicated that he could drain the water to Mitchell Road through a, um, uh, a swale on his property. But the, we're correct that we're collecting the water from Lot 3 and channeling it down uh, on Lot 4A and 4B the best we can without going on the Jumani property. Oh, okay. but we, and that's why we gave him an easement. He wasn't willing to allow me to go on to his property and put a, a swale, but we gave him an easement to do, to do that. correct it the way he would like to correct it. He felt that that would affect the saleability of his property. So, um, and there's the town property a little bit further on, and, and then the then town prop goes under the road where that drains away. Correct. Yeah. There's a, the stream, as you probably remember, there's a little stream that comes here and goes to a catch basin, which I installed when we did Blueberry Ridge, and that has the capacity to handle all the water, and it takes it, and puts it on to the other side of Mitchell Road. And the angle's down, so it runs down the road, down the wall. Correct. Uh, you know, yeah, without, so that swale will take it down, down to the bottom and to that area where there's a pipe under the road or where. Correct, uh, correct, yep, okay. well, yep. That, that looked to me as if it would work. A technical request, Rick, um, because all of this drainage relates to surrounding lots and those surrounding lots are referred to in our approvals, I think it would be important that you label on the plan lot three and also label the Germanis lot land now or formerly belonging to the Germanis in some appropriate way uh, because all of these really do tie in and on the plan I have in front of me, those <coughs> lots are not labeled. Okay. On, the, on the plan that we submitted, uh, with the easements, it does identify lot three. Unfortunately, it has Norman and Lorraine naming uh, as the uh, Germani property, so we can correct that. Okay, but I'm, I'm saying I'd like to see that not just on the plan that is attached to the easement, but on the subdivision plan itself, that those That's other lots are labeled. The one that will be recorded. Mm. Right. Correct. Right. 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 Which, yes, we'll make it. She wants it on both plans. Yeah, on both plans. So that the surrounding lots are labeled. Not just the plan that's recorded. Okay. So, if I may, I, one question. I, the maintenance of the wall, whilst I understand that you say it's semi-permanent um, and shouldn't need any maintenance, if it does, whose responsibility is that and who's actually agreed to maintain that, if anybody? That would go with the answer to the question, but that would go within the easement, the, the drainage easement, that wall would go with each lot. So the lot owner of lot 4A would be responsible for the... For the, for the new wall. Right. And the lot owner of 4B would be responsible for any portion on their lot. Any portion of the wall. Of the wall on that lot. The portion of the wall that they're, they're, they've got on their land. Yes. Yes. So That would need heavy equipment to move stuff around, right? I mean, can you get... Can you get that equipment in behind those, those walls? Mm -hmm. I mean, to push them back. That's what the 15-foot easement will accommodate. The equipment to come up through the back of the properties and, and do what it has to do. Okay. All right. Right. And that's why it was 15 as opposed to 10. Right. Thank you. Maureen, have we had our attorney take a look at these easements? I just had a question about the easement deed that was from Mr. Frustacci to Mr. Frustacci and whether that was the appropriate legal instrument because he was giving something to himself. We, I have sent everything to the town attorney and he's provided some comments. Uh, my suggestion, my experience has been that whenever you send an attorney something, they have comments and that the applicant's attorney then needs to make adjustments and it's best to get the two attorneys together to work it out. So okay. my recommendation to the board would be to attach a condition of approval if you're willing to vote for an approval this evening, that leaves the final language of the easements up to the attorney to approve. Okay, because there's also an amendment to the Declaration of Covenants and Restrictions that seems to me perhaps a more appropriate place to put an easement 
as opposed to having the grantor and the grantee be the same individual. But I would certainly leave that yeah. to the just, attorneys who are reviewing it. Yeah, just to help you out, that, that easement was given to me as the owner, but also it says to assignees and... and right. I, I understand what you're trying to do. I'm just, I just question whether it's legally effective or if there's a better, a different way to phrase it that would create the legal effect you're trying to get to. Um, whatever the attorneys agree right. to. I'll yeah. I think we should ask them to look at that. If the board wants to see the actual language yourself, I mean, that's certainly your option as well. Okay. Sorry to belabor this point for one time. If you look at the swale, at the back of the swale, there is the clay liner. So if you're on the right-hand side of that wall, where you, I think you show a tree or whatever, that, that looks like a tree there. If you're on that side, you can repair the wall. But if, you're on, if you want to repair it from the other side, you have to have an easement for whoever owns that other side of the wall. Right, the, um, on this side of the wall. Yeah, the if you need side, to repair yeah. the clay or something, then you need yes. to be able to go over. And is that easement part and parcel of the agreement so you can get at it from the other side? Yes, it is. It's part of the, the easement is with, goes, the easement, the 15 foot easement is from here to here, essentially. So, so that's whoever, the, but it's at the, responsibility of the owner of the property on the right-hand side of that wall, that they could actually have an easement to the left-hand side of the wall for repair purposes. I know it sounds complicated, but um, I don't better to sort it out now. It's the Germani's property, so that, that they, would be, they would be receiving rights to that easement according to the way it's been drafted, so that the people on the lot here, adjacent to the wall, you're right, would be subject, they would be recipient of that easement, correct, Joe? But even so, they, even so, they'd still have to go to the left-hand side of the wall to repair any liner for that wall, which means that correct. on this correct, because they, they, they would have rights to the easement here as well. This is their property here. They would have rights to this land between their property line, including the wall, to the other side of that easement. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry to belabor it. No, I understand. And, 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 and. Well, now I have a further question. Why would the Germanis be repairing the wall if the wall is on lot 4A? I wouldn't think they would. If okay. they, but if they had maintenance, if they felt that they had an obligation to get on this lot, but they would do it. The maintenance of the wall, the primary maintenance of that wall belongs to the lot owner of that lot. The 4A. The 4A. Yeah. And they're obligated to maintain it right. if it's on the site plan, right. right? So if it starts falling apart in 50 years, they're legally obligated to fix it. Right. And, and I'm not an attorney. I don't want to play attorney, but yeah. that would put someone in a situation where does one have a civil suit on that case be a private, you know, that is a private matter if the wall then is actually, if the wall were to deteriorate, if something happened to the wall and it ended up on their lot, like with any wall, that's, that would be a condition. But anybody to down the line of that wall who's not responsible for that part of the wall, but the wall further up the line is leaking, they're going to come down onto their property. Mm -hmm. So if they all don't agree to repair it, then it still could be a problem. And, and, but that's the purpose of the easement. It gives them the rights to go in there, the rights to have access. That's the owner of the property of the right. wall that they're looking at. But to my right, if I'm looking at the wall, to my right, there's another part of the wall that may have broken down a bit. And that owner of that land, to my right, doesn't want to repair it. Then it's going, the water's still going to come down onto my, onto my lot. That's just the nature of... Un understood. In, in, a, in a unique situation, if that were to happen, but I, I would suggest that if that was the case, my thinking would be the owner of that particular lot would then not be performing to the intent of the drainage easement, not because the, the, the water would, if the wall failed, if something happened to the wall, again, these walls typically don't fail, it's only, you know, two to four feet high. If that failed, the owner of that lot then would not be would not be caretaking in terms of the it, easement and the drainage itself. So I think and I was mistaken when I yeah. when I thought that the wall belonged not the end of the, to the party that had the end of it on their property, mm -hmm. but that it was going to be further upstream, and that there was going to be somebody else's responsibility for the whole wall. And, and I, look, I guess that was where I was mistaken. Okay, looking at the plan to be clear, when we walked the site the other day, I'm look, using the cursor here up on the on the screen. The wall will end here, and, it, and this, instead of going, you know, beyond this property line down here, we show the wall ending at the property line. Correct. Because of the issue of extending that wall, getting easements from the other property owners. So we're collecting, as you saw from the site, while we're collecting, 
as much water as can physically go this way based on topography. Yes, uh, what, yep. what I want to add is at the bottom of the wall, or I, I have to shut up, I'm sorry, I just yep. will show you. Yep. This, the, the ground is shown here, it drops down, right, to where there's a, um, the, the tank problem. Correct. So the water is going to hit that wall, start running down the inside of the wall from where it can't go any further, and then fall onto the bottom of the So if there's a problem with the wall on the right, the water will come through and then now it will continue on down as it does at the present moment and get everybody wet. So the property owner on the left is going to have, the property owner on the right is going to have responsibility for the property owner on the left. Correct. So, you know, here I am with my wall, it's great, but my, but my neighbor's wall is it's not working well and I'm getting wet and I can't do anything about it. All right, let, let me see if I can help you out here. The wall on lot 4A runs the entire life. There's only one abutter, and that's Mr. Jamani. So there's only one property owner, and he has the easement or the right to come and correct that wall. Right. The other wall kind of just tails off and disappears on lot, on lot 4B. Right, but if it's Mr. Jamani doesn't maintain it, then Mr. Sargent gets water on his lot. Yeah. If, if, yes, but he's, he has that responsibility, and Mr. Jamani has the, the right to correct any failure of that, of that swale on, on the new lot that we're trying to create. And, I, and there's also a, 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 that would be a violation of the requirement that that wall be maintained, and so there would be rights right. on that, too. Because I mean, I mean, it seems to me that the wall is very important to this project. Right. You know. Right. So if you don't get all the details worked out beforehand, you could run into legal problems well, later on. It, correct, correct. And, and we're, you know, we're making an attempt, and I think it's a, it's a, a major a correction of, of the drainage problem that Mr. Sargent is, is experiencing. Yes. And Mr. Danini, I mean, Mr. Germani has expressed a desire to assist also. So I think that uh, the Sargents are going to benefit tremendously by this. Uh, and and as, I, as I did mention, that there's only one property owner that's going to be looking at the, uh, that, that rock wall. Uh, and that's the, uh, the people that have an easement to, to correct it if there's something wrong with it. When, uh, excuse me, when, when is this wall erected with regard to development of the lot? When, what comes first, the house or the wall? The wall. We'll do all the site work prior to uh, actual construction. Anybody else have any questions? I had one question, more, I guess it's probably for you, Maureen, on the uh, <clears throat> proposed order that talks about the affordable housing provision, number five. And my question is just whether the last sentence of that item, number five, is necessary. I was a little concerned because um, I'm sure Mr. Christashi is very familiar with our affordable housing requirements. He's built a couple of houses already. But the ordinance, the mandatory affordable housing provisions allow for the provision of a lot or the provision of a lot with a house on it. Right. And if you are only going to be providing an affordable lot, it has to be sold at the low income price, not the moderate income price. And that's why I added that last sentence. Because it's, it's it, that you're actually getting to what my question was. It seems to me that as that I'm not sure that we have a need to limit that option if there's an option to either sell it at the low income price as a lot. In other words, whatever would comply with the statute I think if the applicant wants to go with a different approach, though, I think it needs to be no. Does that need to be decided at this now? time? Because Why? I, because you are attaching a condition that selects either moderate or low income now. Do we have to do that? You really should. Because that, I mean, this. My first reaction was, what if the applicant chooses to sell a lot, and is it necessary for us to restrict 
the applicant to only selling a developed lot as opposed to an undeveloped lot? I, I would suggest if the applicant really wants to do that, that they should come back and amend this approval and apply the appropriate restrictions to it. Because right now we're going to be recording a deed restriction that limits it as a moderate income affordable lot with a home on it. Right. And is that and agreeable? And if you want to just sell the lot for the moderate income home price, we're kind of missing their, you're not meeting the requirements of the ordinance. But I guess my question is, do we need to do anything more now than impose a deed restriction on lot three that says that this lot can only be conveyed in accordance with the mandatory affordable housing provisions? Because the, leave it to the affordable housing provisions allow for low income and moderate income. Right. And whether you go with the low or mod depends on, I mean, because obviously it's a lot easier to sell a moderate income affordable home because you can charge a lot more for it than a low income affordable home. So applicants will choose one or the other based on, frankly, minimizing the burden of meeting this requirement. So large subdivisions tend to go with the low income because they can do fewer lots. Small subdivisions go with the moderate income because it gets a lot closer to the market rate price that they would actually like to be able to charge. Uh, but if, the, if, if this lot is going to be sold without a house on it for the moderate income price, it's not affordable. Because our pricing is based on a lot with a house on it. Does that make sense? I'm sure it does. Okay. <laughs> So I, I guess what you're saying is that the way our statute is set up, mm -hmm. we need Mr. Frustacci to dis decide now whether he's going to sell a lot with a house on it or whether he wants to retain the option just to sell the lot undeveloped. Right, in which case he has to sell it at a low income price as opposed to a moderate income price, which is what this restriction is right now. And it's, I mean, to be fair, uh, Mr. Fustachi is probably one of the most familiar developers with the affordable housing requirements, has come before the board in the past to make adjustments, and I would expect he would feel free to come back and amend this approval if for some reason it wasn't working with his plans. So was this the applicant's choice to choose the moderate no, it's up to the planning board, but the, it's up to the planning board. But under the restrictions, the affordable housing requires that 10% of your subdivision has to be affordable to moderate income or 5% of your subdivision has to be affordable to low income. And because Mr. Fustachi is working with, I think right now it's a seven-lot subdivision, it's a much lower burden for him to provide one moderate income home than one low income home because we round up. Are you happy with this restriction? Maureen and I discussed it uh, okay. at length, and uh, yes, I'm, obviously I'm here before you. Uh, right. Yeah, this, is, this is more than acceptable. Comfortable proceeding with the moderate. Another reason why I wouldn't be comfortable with uh, relinquishing uh, control of uh, the lot at Blueberry Ridge is I built most of those houses in there, and, and I want to maintain the um, uh, the theme that's there. Um, want to make sure that the subdivision, um, that the the infrastructure isn't disturbed by uh, another builder. Um, but I don't think there'd be too many people wanting to buy a lot to build you know, a low-income house. Uh, there's no profit in it, so uh, let me lose the money as opposed to somebody else. At least I'll be doing it with with some pride in the of, the of the neighborhood of Blueberry Ridge. So the deed restriction that you refer to, that this language refers to, is in fact in the form of this agreement and option to purchase? Yes. <laughs> Which yes. isn't really a deed restriction. I, I presented it to our town attorney, and I, I posed the question, is this going to work to do what we need it to do? And he said yes. It functions more like a deed restriction than a purchase and sale agreement, but it is a purchase and sale agreement that would be recorded for Lot 3 prior to recording this subdivision. So it would run with Lot 3. Any conveyance of Lot 3 would trigger this, this restriction. 
Should we change the wording? Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. If, if rather than, ref to me, referring to this as a deed restriction is very confusing. I agree. So can we call it? Um, A recorded restriction for lot three of Blueberry Ridge subdivision in a form that runs with the title to the land? That's fine. Okay. The reluctance to depart from what is called the purchase and sale agreement is because the town actually hired an attorney to draft that purchase and sale agreement language to fit with our existing ordinance language in the mandatory affordable housing provisions. And then we offer it to applicants as a free option. If they want to come up with a different way to uh, meet the requirement, we're willing to review that. But this is something they know that they can put their name on, and it will be acceptable to our town attorney. So it's a much, it, it almost eliminates the burden of them meeting this, the administrative burden of them meeting this requirement. It restricts it just to the cost burden of meeting this requirement. Okay. So that's why we, we, we live with some of the awkwardness sometimes. Okay. So then the other thing we would need to add is that the plans be revised um, to identify all of the abutting lots. That's all the easement lots. All the well, all of the abutting lots affected by the drainage easements. Anybody else have any questions? Anyone want to make a motion? I could, but I'm not sure I got your language on the recorded restrictions for lot three. I think there was some additional change um, there on point number five. So that it would say that um, recorded restrictions rather than deed restrictions. Yep, I got that. Recorded restrictions for lot three of Blueberry Ridge subdivision in a form that runs with the title to the land. Is anyone else? I'm happy to do it. Oh, you're good at this. <laughs> All right, here goes. Motion for the board to consider. Findings of facts. Fact. Joseph Frustacci. It's all right. Joseph Frustacci is requesting an amendment to the previously approved Rosewood subdivision to create an additional lot located at the end of Rosewood Lane, which requires review under Section 1625 of the subdivision ordinance. The town engineer is recommending minor revisions to the boulder retaining wall design. Number three, preservation of landscaping should be incorporated into the development of the lot. Number four, the applicant has agreed to pay a fee instead of setting aside open space. Number five, the applicant has agreed to designate a new moderate income affordable housing lot in Blueberry Ridge instead of meeting the affordable housing requirement in the su Rosewood subdivision. Number six, the plan includes a stormwater design that requires the establishment of drainage easements to convey water and an, amendment, um, and an amended road maintenance agreement for Rosewood Drive. Number seven, the applicant has substantially addressed the standards of the subdivision ordinance, section 1631. Therefore, be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Joseph Frustacci for an amendment to the previously approved Rosewood subdivision to create an additional lot located at the end of Rosewood Lane be approved subject to the following conditions. Number one, that the plans be revised to address paragraph five of the town engineer's letter dated 5-11-2001. Number two, that a note be added to the plans restricting activities outside the building envelope to installation of driveways, utilities, and regarding 
regrading and retaining wall construction consistent with the stormwater design for the lot. Number three, that a note be added to the plans that five white pines will be planted. Uh, to be planted will be a minimum of six to seven inches in diameter at the time of planting. Number four, that an open space impact fee of $4,455 be paid. Number five, that recorded restrictions for lot three of Blueberry Ridge subdivision um, in a form that runs with the title to the land be recorded designating that lot as a moderate income affordable lot under mandatory affordable housing provisions, section 1974 of the zoning ordinance. The applicant agrees to sell the lot with a home constructed on the lot for no more than the moderate income affordable home price applicable at the time. Number six, that the road maintenance agreement and drainage easements, three, be submitted in a form applicable to the town attorney, signed by the applicant and recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds. Number seven, um, that the plan be revised to identify all of the abutting lots affected by the drainage easements. And number eight, that the plans be revised and submitted to the town planner for review and approval, and that all above conditions be satisfied prior to recording the subdivision plat. A comment. Uh, Madam Chair, if I might, on uh, just a advocation on note number three, uh, that a note be added to the plans that five white pines be planted will be minimum six to seven feet. Oh, five. And Thanks. should we add a, a note that it would be? Or if it's clear enough to the board that it be sub, they're, they're the specific locations be subject to the need as, as, as the applicant sees fit on the property. That, that we're not going to, we haven't shown a specific spot for those trees as long as it's understood that those will be as infill. Could we add to note three at the end and adjust and field adjust and the location adjusted in the field? That would be perfect, yeah. Thank you. You accept those changes, Liza? I do. Thank okay. you. We have a second. Second. Okay. Discussion. Maureen. I'm not allowed to do discussion, but I, I think the chair picked up a, um, something that's missing. In your motion, yes. I should have also referred to the private access way permit that's required for lot four, lot four. And so what I would recommend to the board for consideration is where you have your motion, therefore be it ordered that. Based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Joseph Rustashi for an amendment to the previously approved road through the subdivision to create an additional lot located at the end of the road at the end of Rosewood Lane and a private access way permit mm. for lot four be approved. And do we need a finding on that? Do we have to make yeah. a finding? We can slip on that if we need to. If you want to add the same thing to the finding, we can do that. I think I'd feel more comfortable if, if we had a finding on that also. What, what you could do is, uh, under findings of fact number one, mm -hmm. Joseph Ustashi is requesting an amendment to the previously approved Rosewood subdivision to create an additional lo lot located at the end of Rosewood Lane and a private access way permit for lot four. But so is there anything, any specific finding that we need to make in order to justify the granting of that private access way? No. No. Okay. You may accept, I'm going to say, on number seven. And, and I think Joe's saying it's lot 4B. Well, it's for this lot here, this four, is 4A. Four four. Okay. It's 4B. Is. 4A. Okay, 4A. And then under number seven, uh, there's seven findings of fact. Yeah. The applicant has substantially addressed the standards of section of the subdivision ordinance, section 1631, comma, and private access way. Okay standards in section 19-7-9. Madam Chair, if I might, if it's, if it's okay, I think the private access way, would, it's for the end lot to re, for the reduced frontage, correct? That would be lot 4B. Just so we're clear. Oops. All the references should be 4B. 4B. Private right. access way, 4B. So we now have Liza, do you accept those amendments? To I do accept those amendments. So the first finding of Facts, private access way permit for 4B, and then the seventh finding of facts, including the private access way ordinance 1979. Yeah. Okay. Carol, do you accept those? It, yes. Add those to your second. Yes, I do accept those. I'm okay. just looking confused because 
I thought 4A was the new lot and 4B was the current That's right. structure. Right. Yeah, the one that <laughs> you're right. The front thought, of you're right. Is the one that needs the private access way permit. And actually, the new lot has sufficient frontage. Uh, so we're reducing the frontage. It's the old lot that is okay. yes. sufficient. The old lot is 4B. All right. Okay. I'm all set. Four Okay. Anybody else? Any further discussion? You ready to vote? All in favor? That's five in favor. None here to be opposed. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. In just a moment, we will move to our next item on the agenda. Take a very brief break. Next item on our agenda is Bothell Blueberries RP permit, resource protection permit. 
Adam Salve is requesting a resource protection permit to remove 31,581 square feet of vegetation in an RP1 buffer in order to plant high bush blueberries on the lot located behind 88 Ocean House Road. Section 1983 resource protection permit. Uh, the issue before us is completeness. Let me just make a brief mention of what our procedure is going to be tonight because we are having a public comment period, something a little bit new for us. The applicant will make his uh, presentation. This is not a public hearing tonight, but we will open the floor for public comment on the issue of completeness, and we will follow the same procedure that we used earlier this evening when we were having a formal public hearing. So if you want to go ahead and make your presentation, we'll go from there. Okay. Um, just First, say, introduce yourself. My name is Adam Selvey, um, son of Stephen and Pat Bothell, who are the landowners. Thank you. Um, what we're talking about is uh, Route 77, Bothell's garage, will be located right here. Um, 88, 90, 94, and 96 Ocean House Road are all owned by the same property owner. Um, this land right here is depicted as Rita D. Preston, who is also a family member. Um, the area in question, I didn't put the key on, but would be the red on your map. Um, that would be the area for the protection permit. Um, it's also shown here. Um, it would be the little triangle. Uh, we plan to plant uh, about 700 high bush blueberry plants um, in the area. As it stands right now on your map, uh, the clearing on the aerial view lines up with the northeast side of the striped area. Um, this, the striped area is what is planted as it stands right now. Um, from the buffer line uphill is planted right now with blueberries. Um, the lower half of the clearing, there is no planned activity in. Um, planting is all to be carried out in the striped area. Uh, the green area is going to be part of the project, but not, it is not included in the permit. I just put it on there for scale as to, you, you can see the trees on the aerial view. Um. Clarifying question. Yep. So if the green stripes are currently planted with blueberries, yes. does that mean that there are some blueberry bushes within the buffer right now? No, there are not. Oh, okay. Um, the, the green stripes are the clearing on your map, which this map was uh, from 2001 before any work has been done. This was the land in its natural state. So the blueberries that we have planted were in the natural clearing oh, okay. that was pre-existing. Gotcha. So there, there are bushes in the buffer, but there was no clearing done to plant them? There are no, no bushes in the buffer oh. as of right now. Is it correct that the, the bold dotted line is the edge of the resource protection? Yes, on the aerial view it is the red dash line is the 250 foot setback. And on this map it is the black dash line. The and the difference between the striped green and the dark green? Uh, the striped green is what is pre already cleared. Um, and already planted with blueberries. Half of it is, the other half will be planted in the spring. Okay, and the dark, the solid green? The solid green is on your aerial view, the, tri the remaining triangle of trees that I have cleared, but is not in the buffer. Could, I'm sorry, 
There's like this area right here. It appears to be in the buffer. It but is it's this, this is this section here, okay. which is cleared. Uh, I, I didn't show exactly where the... What can you just talk, in, oh, yeah. talk in the microphone okay. so we can all hear the yeah. question? I, want, I was asking about this corner right here that's striped and appears to be within the buffer. Right. Right here. The, the area that is colored is the proposed clearing. Uh, the red area. The red area. What is green, green lines is what is, what is previously a natural clearing. So it's basically this area is the entire plantation. Just, I, gave, I put it on there. I, it's, it's confusing, but I put it on there for a so you have a general overall idea of where, where I'm going. Okay. So no, there are no not, blueberry bushes on no, the stripes not. right now. No. Okay. It would be in the upper right-hand corner of the circle on your aerial view as the map is oriented here is what is planted with blueberries currently. Um, I do have an aerial view. Um, I'm not sure if you still have it from the workshop. Uh, current Google Earth picture that shows what is planted as of right now. Uh, the area that I'm wishing to clear is at a 102 elevation to a 94 elevation. The actual edge of the wetlands is at 76. So I'm 20 feet plus or minus above the wetland area. Um, the reason I'm not choosing another area of the land, um, the circle of trees that looks like it is has been planted was Christmas trees planted by my grandfather, which have since been harvested. That area now is all pasture for cattle that is set up. Um, in the site in red, I have a total of 106 trees that I would like to remove. Uh, 65 of them are hardwood of, with a diameter of less than 6 inches. 12 are softwood with a diameter of less than 6 inches. 16 are hardwood, 6 to 12 inches. 9 are softwood, 6 to 12 inches. There's one hardwood over 12 inches and two softwood over 12 inches. Um, I'm not going to be changing the grade at all. Uh, the natural grade is going to be kept. Um, so there is no, there's not going to be any changing of water flow direction. Um, I am going to be replanting with grass cover prior to having the blueberries planted. Um, the extent of the work should take about two and a half months. Um, all erosion control measures will be in place per state of Maine requirements. Um, at the workshop, um, it was requested for a wetland package. Um, that's packet C on your this should be a handout package with yours. Um, that was done by John Mitchell. Um, the plans as well were done by John Mitchell. I think it was Dale Brewer that wrote. D Dale Brewer did, did this, but the package okay. was put together the first time for gotcha. John Mitchell. Okay. Uh, this plan, uh, we were in for a prior subdivision approval. Um, this, this plan has the open space on it. It also has all of the current property lines on it uh, for 
any question on that. Um, I am going to request one, a waiver. Um, it would be section two, uh, request a waiver to change the one foot required top of contours to two foot intervals. Uh, the one foot got really confusing on the map. Sorry, yeah, I didn't on that. The uh, one foot top of the lines got really confusing on the map. Um, so John Mitchell and I decided to put it to two foot contour lines instead of one foot. Uh, and also, uh, the stormwater plan I'm requesting waiver for as I'm not changing the grade, slope, or water direction for any of the work. Are you removing vegetation, though? I'm removing trees. There is no underlying vegetation, no. There is no, there's currently no grass or moss or anything to that. So those are the two waivers that you're requesting? Yes, that is correct. And do we have a high intensity soils report? Uh, you do not. Um, so are you requesting that that also be waived? Yes. We, uh, Maureen and I, talk, and I talked about it and... I'm sorry? Maureen and I talked about it and we thought that this would cover it, but because I'm not in the actual wetlands, I'm in the buffer. The closest I will get to the actual RP1 wetland is 146 feet at its closest point. So you are asking that we waive the, because the yes. provision does require that specific piece of information and you're asking that we waive that also? Yes. Okay. Anyone have any, are you finished? Yes. Basic presentation? Okay, anyone have any questions before we open it up for public comment? Could I just clarify the red area? The red are area. trees going to be removed or have trees been removed? Trees are going to be removed. Going they have not be. been removed as, as of yet. Okay. And those trees are Christmas trees? No, they're uh, on page two of my proposal um, on section 11. Uh, there's a list of the trees that are there as of right now. So what is the red circle then? Explain that again. The red circle it was just to clarify the area that I'm talking about on the... Just the general area? General area. Okay. So these, these trees that you were going to propose to clear, are they, uh, they, they're just naturally occurring? Or yes. No, they're just naturally occurring. And so within the buffer, you'll clear the trees in the red area, but then you'll plant blueberry trees in a little bit of that green striped area that is currently the, has no growth on it but still within the buffer. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. I thought blueberries were bushes. Bushes, bush. yeah. Oh, did I call them trees? <laughs> yes. So. No problem. So you're requesting the permit not for the planting, but for the clearing? Yes. Is that? Okay. I, I suppose it would cover both the clearing and the planting. And Maureen, what... What specifically about this site? Oh, I, I don't think you need a permit to add more plantings into an RP1 buffer. You, you know, but filling and regrading, it, often when you are re, when you're planting something, you might trigger another thing. So to answer that question, just to put the blueberries in there, if you don't trigger, if you're not regrading or filling, you could probably add those without triggering your resource protection. Program. Okay, so that's why the green striped area is not, some of the part of the green striped area that appears to be in a restricted zone is not part of the permit. Yeah, I don't think, like I said, I don't think you would need a permit just to add plantings to an area that you want to keep vegetated. However, if you're 
if you're ripping up, you know, even if there's no trees there, um, if you're digging and you're, you're disturbing the vegetation that is growing there, you might need a permit. Mm, but I do see that you need a permit for agriculture. Yeah. And so would that include planting and harvesting the blueberries? I, I am more than happy to take this question back to people who can answer it for you. Um, that's a, a code officer determination. I can ask him. I can get an attorney to give you an interpretation on that. But it does make sense that if you do need a permit for that area, we, we the planning board deal with it all at the same time. Okay. Um, so I will check. Yeah, that would be a question whether, if if you're not getting a permit, then I would think we would make it want, need to make it clear that we're not giving our approval to any activity in the green stripe in the striped area. That any consideration that we give would relate only to the red area at a minimum. Unless so that's all we're being amend, asked. Amend your application. I, I understand that all you're looking for is alteration per permission in the area designated in red. Yes, I, I have no intentions of planting. This green striped area right here that is in the buffer is in, I will not be planting, physically planting blueberries in that area. I mow it, but other than that, I do nothing. I, I do not plan on planting. The end of my rows of blueberries will be on my side, the correct side of the buffer line. Okay. Thank you. Quick question? Yes. How will you be accessing that area? For any of it or which, which part? Whatever your future plans are or, and you personally um, uh, get back there? I personally and family have access from up here. Uh, there is currently a agricultural access off Windmill Lane. Um, I brought that up at the workshop and you referred me back to Bruce on that. Um, Bruce and I have been working on that and we've almost come to an agreement as to how that is to be worded. So what, what is your plan then for access to the red part? Uh, I will have pedestrian access through this access way. But the green is existing, right? The green section there is existing blueberry? The Where's your existing blueberry on that chart? Right here. So how do you access that, I guess? You're just going to extend the access from where you get on the back down into the red, is that right? That's correct. This, this entire thing will be one field. Okay, so... So a anywhere... I have... I personally have an access road coming through here, and as I said, there is a existing access. So, so really, there's no new access. You're no going way. to extend your, your, uh, the area that you tend a little bit further. That's correct. But that is in a resource protection area. Is that correct? It is, yes. At access way. But Bruce has determined that no permit is needed for that? He has not referred it to the planning board. OK. So can I ask another question? When you, when you harvest this, how do you, how do you harvest the existing ones? I mean, you'd use a motorized thing, or do you just carry them off? By hand. Well, you harvest them by hand, and then you I access... You put in and move them off? Yes, I access it with my tractor. So, but then you'd have to move the tractor down into that red zone to be able to... Yes. Once the, the grass is there and established, there will be no soil. Um, the soil will not be disturbed. The cover will be staying, regardless of what I drive on it. Oh, yeah. I, I wasn't at the workshop, so um, I was looking at the ordinance before the meeting. I had a question for you, Maureen. Um, what was it about this RP1 wetland that um, made it qualify for the 250-foot buffer instead of the 100-foot buffer? Um, the automatic buffer is 250 feet. So the buffer is always 250 feet, and you need to be eligible for an exemption to go down to 100, and no application for an exemption has been applied for for this wetland, probably because it doesn't qualify for any exemption that would reduce the buffer down to 100. It doesn't qualify for any? Not that I know of. Okay. It's not how I read the ordinance. All right. Okay. Shall we take public comment? Um, I have one more question. 
for the applicant. Okay. Is that all right? So, um, well, one of our st um, standards for review is um, um, can this activity be located elsewhere outside the wetland buffer? And so, my question for you is what, why, why do these blueberries need to be farmed within the buffer? Um, can you locate them somewhere else on the land that's outside of the buffer? Well, I'm expanding the existing field and from the top of my field up is fenced for cattle. So right now so you're using I'm the actually cow. using it for something else. So it has a higher, better use higher, of cow. Yes. Okay. And blueberries have less impact on the wetlands Thank than you. cows would. Thank you. Before we do the public challenge. Okay, we will now open the floor for public comment. Is there anyone who wishes to speak? Good evening, Madam Chair, board members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Bruce McLaughlin. I'm an attorney. I'm here speaking for Joyce Beecher, who owns a property at Four Windmill Lane. Uh, she owns the property that is sandwiched between the Preston property and the Ellis Bothell property, so it's right here. Uh, Mrs. Beecher was unable to be here tonight because she wasn't well enough. Her daughter, Lynn, however, is here with me. Um, I provided a letter today that I think you all have a copy of, and that sets forth most of the issues that we're concerned with. And I know it's getting late, so I'll try to be brief and won't read my letter. Um, the, the main concern we have is that, uh, that there's not enough information and context, we don't believe, for you to really conduct a meaningful review of the activities that are being proposed in and around the buffer zone. Um, I, <coughs> I think you understand, obviously, as, as planning board members, that with zoning, context is everything. Some of the discussions that went on tonight, and I think particularly the discussion about the wall, you can see context is everything. Who's impacting what with respect to adjacent properties and adjacent um, uh, characteristics of the land. And what you have in front of you tonight is an application for a resource protection permit for a tiny portion of what is a much bigger operation. And to look at the, the small piece of property in isolation without understanding the whole blueberry farm operation and how it's going to impact this activity here and the neighbors, I don't think you can really conduct the kind of meaningful review that the ordinance requires. The resource protection permit process requires the use of the procedures in the site plan review ordinance. And because this is an activity that is entering a new use, that is non-residential, we believe that you're required to also do a full site plan review as well as a, a, a resource protection review. There is no uh, description in the plan of some of the facilities. We learned tonight that there is a road here that is planned to be used, and as was disclosed, that road is in the resource protection district. And as such, it's, it was never permitted and is not an authorized use in the resource protection area. Yet, there is no application here seeking permission to use that. However, if you approve this, this application, by implication, as was discussed, you're approving the use of this road through the resource protection district to get to the isolated spot that is the subject of this application. Um, 
as was discussed, there, there's um, a question of why here? Well, we did hear that there's some, some uh, um, cattle on the property that they would prefer to not interrupt, but we don't know what other spaces could be utilized for this purpose. <clears throat> Mrs. Beecher owns the property right here, right here, and her septic is located right here downhill from the proposed operation. She will experience all of the traffic coming through here. Any parking that is required for people to walk up through here, she will experience that on windmill lane. Yet none of those those collateral impacts are part of this narrow, isolated review that's before you. So we, we urge you to determine, for all of the reasons cited in my letter and discussed tonight, that the application is incomplete. We urge you to expand your review to include the use of this road and site plan review of the whole operation. With site plan review, you'll be able to consider the impacts of parking, of access to the site, and how those affect the resource protection district as well as the neighboring properties. Um, Mrs. Beecher has a severe asthma condition, so she's going to be concerned about the impacts of the blueberry operation if there's any kind of spraying. We don't know if there's going to be any kind of spraying. We don't know what's going to be used in, in the resource protection area in the way of um, herbicides or, or pesticides uh, as part of the operation. And um, those are our concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Any other member of the public wish to comment tonight on this matter? Um, I'm Stephen Bothell, and part of most of the properties belong to us. Um, so are you technically a member of the public or applicant? Yeah. A lot closer to applicant. Really? Well, you did You're welcome to speak, okay. but I think technically okay. you, you are okay. an applicant. Okay. <laughs> um, on the comments of the site reviews and everything like that, I can understand going through site reviews in a situation where you're going to be digging putting foundations in and moving large amounts of topsoil and stuff like that for building something. Um, what this project is going to be doing is basically removing the trees and then planting with grass and then putting bushes in. So you're really not changing any of your water flows at all in any of these areas. Um, so you're, I mean, it's not the same thing as digging foundations and putting walls in where you're end up ending up changing water flows where they're going to be moving to a different position and impacting like her comment was the comment on the septic system. The water flows will not change so it, you won't be affecting um, with where the water flows go. Um, and um, as far as travel on the road, it's very limited. I mean most of the time it's just to access for the purpose of um, maintaining. It's not something that would be a highway where there would be droves of people moving up and down it all the time. In fact, the harvest period is a very short period of time. And as far as blueberries go and pesticides and stuff like that goes, we've picked a crop that, number one, doesn't compete with the other farmers that we have in town and is very low maintenance as far as needing anything sprayed on it. It's not like apples that you have to spray them. Three or four times during their growth cycle, blueberries pretty much do not need any sprays. The biggest problem with blueberries are birds taking the crop away. And in most cases, you can either cover them 
or um, put stuff up that scares the birds away. So as far as impacting the water flow or people going in through there or, or equipment even. And as far as noise, I, I don't think blueberries make much noise while they grow. Okay. Thank you. Any other member of the public wish to make a comment? Okay, then our public comment period is closed. I'm going to ask Maureen if you could clarify for us, because some of the things that were mentioned tonight reflect um, decisions that I understand our code enforcement officer has made as to whether or not a site plan approval is required for the activity that the applicant has before us and really is not an issue for this forum. So if Maureen could clarify for us, I guess I thought Bruce might be here, but I guess he's not. So if you could help us understand that context for this evening. Uh, the code enforcement officer is exclusively authorized to interpret the zoning ordinance. Any, um, anyone who doesn't agree with his interpretation has uh, the option to appeal his interpretation to the zoning board. So there's no opportunity by me or by anyone else to influence his decision. Uh, and what he has done is uh, made a determination, and I have in front of me a planning board referral form uh, provided by Bruce that identifies the project by Adam Salve as agricultural clearing land for cultivating blueberries within the 250-foot RP1 buffer. And the only type of review he has designated is a resource protection permit. So he has determined that a site plan permit is not required. It's on the list and he didn't check it. So yes, he's made that determination. And that growing of blueberries in this area is a permitted use. Yes, with a resource protection permit. With a resource protection permit, okay. So I think that helps to put in context really what, what our issues are. So the question before us is completeness, whether we have in front of us enough information to proceed to the next step. It doesn't mean that we have every detail that we might want to know before we do our final approval, as we all know from the past, but whether the application is sufficiently complete for us then to move forward with our procedure. Um, if there is other material that we don't have at this point that we need, then it is the burden of the applicant to provide that at some future point before we're in a position to make a determination, but all of our procedural clocks are, would be running if we deem it complete, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the issue in front of us, completeness. After we make a determination of completeness, we can then decide if we find that it is not complete, our discussion tonight is finished. If we find that it is complete, then we can go forward and decide whether we want to do a site walk and whether we want to schedule a public hearing as our next step. So the first question on the table is that of completeness. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, is it relevant and would we need something that's um, from Rita Preston saying that Adam Salvi is representing her interests on this? Because we have a letter of, uh, from uh, Stephen and Robert Bothell. I don't is believe it, this is uh, on Rita Preston's property. Well, yeah, not the um, red, but the access. But the access is not part of this application. It's not relevant. It's, it's not, we are not being asked to approve any access to this site. It's not on this property. Okay, thank you. Is that correct? <clears throat> Maureen. Oh, Madam Chairman, um, yes. does the town have any oversight in the removal of trees? Yes. Yeah. Um, explicitly, they have a authority to remove, um, they have authority where you are removing trees in a wetland or a wetland buffer. Um, also, if you are removing a large quantity of trees, which would trigger a forestry management plan or timber harvesting. And the forestry management timber harvesting doesn't get triggered very often. If you're outside a wetland buffer, however, you can, you can remove trees. Mm -hmm. Can I ask the applicant one other question? Sure. Adam, can you 
I'm, I'm, I'm not really with it. I to be with you now. The, the lines that go the green. Help me. What's in the green again? Just that part. From here up is planted with blueberries outside of the buffalo. So on the correct side of the buffer line is planted with blueberries currently. That's all blueberries? Yes. And what's down below? This area is cleared for blueberries. I wish to finish off the field with this. So subject. where are the cattle? From, there's a 10 foot buffer, I'd say, yeah. from the edge of my plants to my fence line. So from here over is fenced. And then in the left hand lower corner, left corner, down, no, up. Yeah, keep going left. Help me. What's there? Right there is nothing that is proposed. It's clear it's cleared. It used to be the Christmas trees that are depicted here. So you're not planning to plant blueberries there? I am planning to plant blueberries here. This entire section is planned to be planted with blueberries. And that clarifies. I was confused. Thank you. I have one more question. So the 31,000 square feet that's, um, that was referenced, yes. um, is that just the entire blueberry crop? Or no, just what you want? To, that's only in the Just the buffer. buffer. Okay, thank you. So it's almost an acre just in the buffer. Yeah, it kind of turns out to be about three quarters. Three quarters, right. Okay. I guess I have one question. Does planting blueberries change anything about the, uh, I mean, at the present moment it's brush, and I guess it's quite natural growth. But if you take the natural growth away from blueberries, do you change anything other than just growing one thing in re preference to another? No. The only soil disturbance that needs to be done is the, st the stumps from the existing trees need to be removed. And then the resultant growth, does it affect any animals other than, no. I mean, other than the birds having a little bit more to eat? No, they have, which winds up to be almost two and a half, three acres over here that can never, ever be touched because it's all in the buffer. Thank you. I guess I would say I'm not completely comfortable with the waiver of the high intensity soils map. I'm not clear if that's a completeness question or not. The guidance on that, Maureen? Um, the high intensity soils map is, I think, most valuable for when you're installing septic systems or when you're trying to identify wetland boundaries. In this case, um, the wet, I think the applicant is borrowing from an earlier approval from the planning board, and I think those, those, there's no information that those wetlands have not been very accurately mapped. Uh, and they were mapped by uh, a registered soil scientist and a surveyor. So if you're comfortable with where the location of the wetland boundaries are, and there's no information that they're in the wrong place and everything indicates that they were well done earlier and the applicant is just bringing that inf information forward and there's no installation of a septic system as part of this project. This is the kind of thing you typically waive the high intensity soil survey and I, I qualify that because there is the good information about the wetland boundaries. So maybe what I'm more concerned about then is number nine, the waiver of the stormwater runoff plan. I guess conceptually what I'm concerned about is that if we're approving clearing in the wetland buffer for agricultural use, I would want to know that whatever happens in that area is not then going to run off into the wetland in some way that's going to damage the wetland. So I'm not sure which one of these studies is going to tell me that, but I would think perhaps maybe it's the stormwater runoff that I'm not, so if that's the reservation, does that, is that a completeness question or not necessarily a completeness question? If we think, if I would think that I would want to see one of those. It's a completeness question. It's a completeness question. Okay. And the other thing concerning runoff is do you, if you use a pesticide and or um, make it grow a fertilizer, and I guess 
It's 20 percent of is that 20 percent? The orange represents about 20 percent increase in the amount of blueberry area that you've got. 15, 20 percent of my yes, about. guessing. Yes, about. Yes. So does that? Do you apply fertilizer and or um, pesticide for that, or are they just no. totally natural? Uh, we're going for an or organic approach. We are not going to get certified organic due to the cost. Um, there is no chemical fertilizers or pesticides, or pesticides being used. Uh, the only fertilizer that we use is compost. So my guess is you don't really change. I'm oh, sorry, that's not. I guess you don't really change much of the flow of the runoff. Well, but I'm not sure. Based on a discussion we had in a workshop, it's not clear to me that we can condition our approval or that we ever have on the use or non-use of fertilizers or pesticides in an agricultural operation. My understanding was that that was not one of the conditions that we would get into. Is that correct? Yes. And, Sorry. and I just wanted to, um, Mr. Steinberg, would you, when you remove uh, quantities of vegetation from the ground, you change the storm water. Okay. And then but when you put something back, Yep. But trees and, and suck that up. that will also have an impact. When you put something back, that has an impact as well. And how, but do you, how does one judge that? You have to call an expert. So what uh, engineers, I've seen the tables, thank God I don't have to use them. But um, engineers will actually evaluate um, not just the soil type, because different soils absorb water at different rates, even at different slopes. Right. Uh, but they also look at the ground cover. So, for example, a, a, you know, a gravel has very little perviousness. Right. Uh, a ledgy area, not so much perviousness. A forest is going to absorb more than a uh, mowed lawn. So, yeah, so it, it seems to suggest that you need that report. Yeah, yeah, Henry, I mean, when you think about how much water a tree will move compared to a blueberry bush, it's a huge difference. Yeah, and then yeah. the root system being there with the erosion and runoff. And the other way it seems to me that this presentation is not complete in the traditional sense is that I think you have here the information that tells, you, tells us about your project and the areas covered, although you don't have it in a way that I would understand if you weren't here to tell me about it. Um, so I think we need your areas more clearly defined and labeled on your, on your plan so that we really understand what all those striping areas are and the solid areas and the red areas and so that we can be very clear in our approval what we're approving and addressing and what we're not approving and not addressing. That alone to me would not hold up complete, completeness because I think we have the information, we just don't have it labeled appropriately. But I am concerned on completeness without the stormwater runoff plan. I don't know if we could go ahead and do a site walk to kind of move the matter forward while that happens, or if we really if we don't think it's complete, we just have to say so and not proceed on the site walk. My view is that we definitely are going to need a site walk. I don't know what, how others feel on that. Usually, you do not have a site walk until you have a complete application. However, you have made exceptions to that. Normally, your exceptions are when you're trying to beat the weather. If it's November and you want to see the land before it gets covered with snow, you will sometimes schedule a sidewalk in advance. The, the problem is usually when you're out there, you want to have a plan in front of you. Um, if, if you're relatively satisfied with the plans and you're looking for this additional information that um, wouldn't necessarily help you when you're out there looking at the site anyway, you, I mean, you, you've got some flexibility in this situation. What other people think about we should about the site walk in advance of completeness or completeness? Both. I, I, I echo your comments about the map. And then um, also just on the, on the submission, um, there, there are some errors, like um, number 11, um, it says that there will be grading done within, within the proposed area, and then, which is not a permitted use. You told us that there is that there will be no grading, so that's a significant change. And then, on the um, sizes of the trees, um, where it's supposed to be less than six inches, it's labeled greater than or less than 12, 
where it's greater than 12 inches, it's labeled as less than. So I just feel like there are just a lot of errors where um, it, if it were cleaned up, both what the proposal is, where the trees will be, and what your plan is for the work, and what's going to be taken away, it would help us and the public review the application better. Adam, did, did Mitchell, is, have they marked the boundaries here? If I walked out there, would I be able to tell on the face of the earth where we're talking about? As far as this area here? Yeah. No. No? No. Um, Mitchell and Associates is not involved in your, your current application, is that correct? No, they did the maps for me, but other than that. So, Mr. Olfine, they, they wouldn't be marking any boundaries now. So, shall we? Anybody else have any questions, or do we want to proceed with the completeness question? Anyone want to make a motion? I'm willing to make a motion. Um, so, motion for completeness. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Adam Salve for a research, research protection resource protection permit to clear 31,581 square feet of RP1 wetland buffer to plant high bush blueberries on a lot located behind 88 Ocean House Road be deemed incomplete. Do I have a second? Victoria, second. Before we take a vote, um, I need to let everybody know that once we do this vote, if we find it incomplete, we can't ask any more questions or do any more discussion or give any more guidance. So anything anyone would like to any offer, time. we well, should I'd see like it before we vote. Just for clarification, the, the tree removal, would an applicant be required to submit additional information, a forestry plan or a detailed plan from a licensed forester to remove the trees? I can come back to you with um, a summary of what the ordinance requires. Would that be sufficient? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I just one thing. If you remove trees, what are, and this is a question I guess, but what's the, what's the rule with replanting some trees to make up for what you move? In other words, if you remove 20 other trees and you put 20 trees in, or 20 other trees. Putting in blueberry bushes. Well, I know you're putting in blueberry bushes. You don't want trees. You need the sun. Well, no, but I'm not on top of the blueberries, but I mean in that generalized area. If you replace them close by, that's what I'm trying to say. You're, you're taking away some uh, evaporation processes from the water thing and replacing them with, tree, with bushes. And now, can you replace trees somewhere else on there to make up? And that's all I'm saying. Oh, Is that a needle or am I... Uh, the, the resource protection permit standards do provide for mitigation. So certainly an applicant could come in with a, a two-part proposal. Part one, I'm going to do this in this part of the wetland. And part two, I'm going to make up for what I did there by doing this and this and this in this part of the wetland. Yeah. So yes, you could, you could add plantings in an area that works for you that enhances the bottom. Yeah. Those are definitely options. And, that's, and, and that could be something that we could insist on or... or in the uh, just to so, kind of yeah. clarify so that would be a point for the applicant to take into consideration right reapplying or perhaps the issue is what happens with the water that's going to drain off of here and, and if there's another way to deal with that water so that it doesn't impact the wetland planting trees might be one way creating some kind of retention facility might be another way to deal with the impacts of what you're, the impacts on the wetland of what you're planning to do. Yeah, and, and to further that advice, I would just um, refer you to the part of the ordinance, um, section 1983, beyond the submission requirements. There's a section on um, resource protection permit standards and resource protection permit conditions. And those are some of the things that we might look at in actually approving the application. So you might want to look that over and make some mention of some of the other things that we'll be looking for in order to um, approve the permit. Okay. 
As, as it stands right now, um, you can see on the top of the map, uh, up in the corner it says RB2 wetland A. Uh, that wetland there is actually a retention pond that is on site, has been existing. And if you look at the top of lines, it, everything flows into that pond and then flows downstream from there. I think that's the sort of thing that a stormwater plan would help us understand, is that right? Sure, you're you're part. You're an applicant too, right? So you're an own, you're a property owner, um, yes. and then an applicant. Okay. Okay. Um, if I could understand then what you're saying is, if we weren't interested in that little red piece, we could be planting blueberries till the cows come home and nobody would care. If you were not in the the resource protection buffer, which is not just the little red piece but it's everything to the right of that red line, the, the dotted line. The dotted line. Right. Everything to the right of the dotted line is subject to resource So where we're working here already, this does not concern you. Only what concerns you is on the other side of this line. If what you're re at, referring to as a resource protection permit, that's correct. The other part of the property could concern us if you were doing something that triggered but some we other statute. But if were just planting blueberries, the rest of this wouldn't even come before this board? You'd ask, ask Bruce Smith. You'd have to confirm that with Bruce. But that's generally my understanding, but that's his determination to make. Okay. The only thing that's been referred to the planning board tonight is, is activities is to the is right the of that okay. dotted line. That's right. Okay. That I just wanted to clarify that. Correct. Anything else? Are we ready to vote? So, all in favor of the motion, raise your hand. It's an incomplete motion. It's an incomplete motion. Yes. A motion that it is incomplete. That's five in favor, none opposed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, that's the last item of business on the agenda. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. <laughs> All right. <laughs> adjourn for adjourn. Thank you. That was five zero. We're we're really